Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for your gift of time this morning and for the opportunity to present in front of you. Now, a little bit of a warning, I'm a scientist, so we have terrible trouble communicating uh, in simple terms, but I've tried to do my best. If you do have any questions, please, there'll be an opportunity at the end, and I'll do my best to answer those. So, let's have a little bit look and see how this works. So this is where we are, and this is uh, some new developments that have been going on in Adelaide that's got the research and health community very excited. There is a great deal of new development in terms of building space, the new hospital, uh, and these are some of the buildings that you probably see every time you come up North Terrace. And this includes a model of the, uh, the new Bragg Centre that uh, the new design of the building now is about twice that height that's going to go in between the University of Adelaide building here and Samory here. Um, so this is going to be uh, used for proton therapy for cancer. So it's an exciting time to be part of the health community in Adelaide. Uh, and this is very richly supporting the research that we do. Um, I'm part of the University of Adelaide, as was mentioned. Uh, we have a research facility there that is state of the art. Uh, and I'm part of the Centre for Research Excellence uh, in translating nutritional uh, science into good health. Um, so this is a group of researchers that have a very overt focus on health in a number of clinical settings, but particularly diabetes. And so we're interested in how diabetes is uh, regulated, we're interested in obesity research and also some work in critical illness as well. So it's a great group of people and we have clinical research rooms that we, uh, that we use up here on level four of this building as well, which is terrific. But most of my group is based in Samri, which you guys might know a little bit more as the cheese grater which often gets uh, called in Adelaide. Uh, it's, it's a striking building. It can polarise people a little bit about its design, uh, but it is a terrific building once you get inside. And the facility itself does run tours on Fridays, so I would encourage you, if you're all interested in seeing how the universities of Adelaide and the federal and state governments came together to make this terrific venue, a flagship research institute in Adelaide, uh, please uh, come along have a look at this stunning architecture and the research that it's enabling people to do in Adelaide that we can all be really proud of. So what I'm going to talk to you about here uh, is a little bit of science. Uh, I'm going to first talk a little bit about uh, my research in the gut and why would anyone in their right mind want to study the gut. We're going to be talking about tasting sweet. We're going to be saying what happens to this system in diabetes. Uh, then we're going to start talking about artificial sweeteners and we'll finish off with a study that we've just completed on artificial sweeteners in healthy individuals. So hopefully we'll keep you interested over that time. If you, uh, if you do fall off your chair, I know that uh, you're falling asleep and I should do better. All right, this probably comes as a surprise to no one. Type 2 diabetes is still a global epidemic. Uh, and projections suggest that right now there's 450 million people worldwide deliver, uh, that have this disease. And this is still on the increase with projections about 642 in, uh, million people will have this disease by 2040. So we're doing okay, but we need to do better. So that's what research does for us. It gives us new approaches to both prevent and better manage people that are living with the disease. And that's where our research tries to fit in. Of all the groups in the community, you guys are probably the most aware and informed about what controls blood sugar levels. Um, for, for most of you, none of these will be a particular surprise, but overall blood uh, sugar levels and blood glucose levels are controlled by physical activity, your medications, whether you're ill or in pain, whether you're stressed, de dehydrated, or uh, menstruation or pregnancy in the ladies. Probably you don't realise just how much meal-related control is important in blood glucose. So the, what we eat, how much we eat, uh, how our liver and kidneys are metabolising that and how the food is delivered from our stomach to the, the rest of our body is quite important. And the last three there are all very important parts that the gut plays a role in. And that's why we're interested in the gut in the context of type 2 diabetes research. <laughs> and you never know, if you look hard enough, you might find some surprising thing about the gut. So. Who in this room, show of hands, thinks the gut's a sexy organ? <laughs> Some of you discuss over the dinner table with mum and the kids? No? No one? No one? Oh, well, hopefully at the end of this, this talk you'll feel a little bit differently. The gut's important because it participates in so part much of our day in controlling our blood sugar levels. Um, this just shows a little diagram. Most people think that they're fasting in between meals, but the reality is they're not really. 
because we have three main meals through our day and food is either within our gut or signals from our gut are playing a role in moving sugars out of our blood and into our tissues to store it, the gut plays a very long role throughout our day in controlling how our blood sugar is regulated. So in fact, nowadays, diabetic doctors are now thinking that the, the way the gut controls blood sugar is probably even more important than the things that control fasting blood sugar. And in fact, we probably only spend a very short amount of the time fasting just before we wake up for breakfast. So it shows that the gut is an incredibly important site to be looking. So let's just run through some of the really interesting things that can really, you punch these questions out in Trivial Pursuit questions down the track. So the gut is a sensory structure. It's about nine metres in length. And because it has very highly folded surface layers here, uh, it actually has the surface area of a tennis court. So it's very well adapted to do one of its main jobs, which is absorb nutrients for us. It also produces over 35 different hormones. This is more than any single organ can produce in your body. And these hormones come from cells that line these little folds within it. And they can release hormones directly into the bloodstream nearby. And in fact, this is the route that glucose gets and sugars get across this surface and into the bloodstream here. It also has its own nervous system as well, called the enteric nervous system. It's completely independent of what goes on in the brain. It sends signals and communicates with the brain, but it in itself is a completely independent system. And it has a great deal of complexity that we're still unravelling lots of it. But these are uh, communications with both our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So these are the parts of our sensations that we feel, and then some of, them, some of the ones that are more automatic. It has uh, nerves that are involved in moving food through our body, so making sure that food doesn't get stuck in one location. Uh, and it can also hook into signals coming in from the food we've eaten. So it's an incredibly complex structure. It has its own set of immune systems, immune cells as well, which is incredibly interesting. In some studies, it contains more immune cells than other parts of the body as well. And so they're doing a job of doing surveillance on the food that's passing through us to try and keep us healthy and make sure that we don't get infection, infections. And probably just recently there's been this real explosion of knowledge about the bacteria that live in our guts. Now, up to 100 trillion bacteria live in your gut, and if you were ever probed by an alien, they would consider your body to probably be more bacterial than it is human, because the, the number of bacterial cells is so high. But these guys do generally do a very good job. They help us break down nutrients in our, our body, particularly ones that we can't digest ourselves. Uh, sometimes they can produce a little bit of gas, and uh, you know, some you know, healthy immune uh, gut bacteria means we'll sometimes pass gas. And look, I know the ladies in the room will say it never happens, but <laughs> I'm married, I know it does. Um, so they play an important role in our health, and we're only just starting to understand the roles that they play, and whether or not, if we look after them better, they can give us health benefits as well. It also can detect, much like uh, the skin, it can detect the movement of food going through the gut. It can send pain signals sometimes as well, and some people would have experienced that for sure. Uh, and those, these uh, are nerve pathways that connect through the sympathetic nervous system, through our spinal cord, and send signals up into our brain. Um, but the part of this talk I really want to focus in on this last part is that the gut actually tastes. It has virtually the same repertoire as our tongue and also our nose. It can detect odorants and it can detect nutrients. And this is fascinating to me and this is something we need to know a great deal more about. So the gut, in terms of controlling blood sugar, is shown here. When food uh, leaves the stomach, it then interacts with the side of the gut that's important in absorption, taking nutrients up into our blood. And when it does that, it triggers a whole series of responses in the gut. It causes the release of hormones from the gut. And some of the important ones in terms of blood sugar control are helper hormones. And their job is to carry themselves in the blood to the pancreas to nearly double the amount of insulin your pancreas produces. So the control and release of that hormone is particularly important for blood sugar control. Those other hormones released from the gut can also control the rate that food leaves the stomach, which is important in terminating our meal size and making us feel full. 
And as I've already mentioned, it also absorbs a lot of the nutrients we have, and that in itself can lead to a sensation of fullness. So the gut's participating in these during a meal, and the hormones that it releases are participating in the response to that meal in the body. Who here doesn't like sweet? It's a very, very, there are some exceptions, I agree, and I do enjoy a good bitter, but uh, we're, we're programmed to seek high energy value foods. Uh, they're an important fuel for our brain, it's our primary fuel source for our brain, but when we see pictures like this, there's also reward programs uh, in the brain that fire off and make us anticipate having a nice meal, uh, and when we're rewarded when we eat it, we also activate the brain reward centres as well. And how we do that is a little bit like how a lock fits into, a key fits into a lock. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit sciencey. so I thought I'd do this first to try and give you a, an idea of how things fit together. So if you consider the key to be a little bit like your sugar, or maybe even an artificial sweetener, and the lock to be a sweet taste receptor. So this is a protein that's able to recognise the shape of a sweet molecule and respond to it appropriately. So when we eat, it's the same as the key going into a lock, opening up the lock, and the body can detect that sweet and respond to it. So probably in the last 10 years, there's been an explosion of knowledge about how our tongue detects and the actual molecules and proteins that allow us to do that. And I don't expect you to understand or retain any part of this other than that over the last 10 years, we've understood the structures that are responsible for, for sweet, for bitter taste, for sodium and salt taste, sour and carbonation. We now know more about fatty acid taste as well. Um, and starch taste as well. There's a whole series of structures that we now know are important for recognising what we eat. Um, the sweet taste receptor, unlike a lot of these, is a single uh, two uh, proteins that come together to form this receptor. Uh, and it is broadly tuned, so everything that we taste sweet is recognised at this receptor. So it's a very important target for us in our research when we want to understand how those interactions work. And for those that want to know a little bit more about it, and there's probably no one, I'll be honest, but anyway, this is the structure of it. So if you look at the protein and how it folds in three-dimensional space, you can build a model of it. And this is the picture of the two parts here binding a sugar molecule here between it. So you can see it interacts with the shape of the structure, and that's how it's recognised. So this is the key here, the round part, fitting into the lock here, which is this receptor. So this is how it works in the tongue. In the tongue, we have taste pores, which are indicated here. And these are in the taste buds. We have between two and 4,000 taste buds on our tongue. And this is just one of them. And they contain cells that contain this particular lock or receptor. And each one of these cells has its own unique receptor. So it recognises it. It turns on the machinery within the cell, changes ions moving into the cell, which can then activate nerves. And these nerves can then convey images of taste into our brain, into a part of our brain called the insular cortex. And you can actually look at that using magnetic imaging and give people uh, something sweet or carbonated, bitter, salty, sour, umami, which is the glutamate, MSG taste, monosodium glutamate, the meaty sort of Asian, it's good in Asian food for some people. Uh, and you can actually get a map of how the brain recognises these different characteristics. So this is going from eating food, recognition and signalling into the brain. Of course, up here, this activates a whole array of reward pathways uh, for us. So we feel good about the food we've eaten uh, and then processes kick in to terminate the meal size. This is probably quite an interesting point for some people. The gut also has sweet taste receptors. It's probably not a big stretch because when we think about the tongue and the gut, they're pretty well connected. And uh, they, during embryogenesis, when we're being formed, they come from very similar cells. Um, the gut also has, these, also has these sweet taste receptors. And this is a, a, from a biopsy we've taken from the lining of the gut wall. And this is one of these cells that we can label up showing that it has the capacity to taste sweet. And it's also a cell that can release one of these helper hormones that I mentioned, which is really quite interesting to know how that interaction works. Um, so 
My talk from here on is going to be talking about this sweet taste receptor in the gut and why we believe it's quite important. So <clears throat> by no means is the story complete, but there's strong evidence from animals that these receptors can release the hormones from the cells that I just showed you. So that one of the pathways that sweet tastes can change insulin and responses in the body is by releasing gut hormones. At the moment, the evidence in humans is a little bit mixed. There's studies that show that it does and studies that show it doesn't. Uh, we very recently, I'm sorry, there's a science alert. Oh, no, this one first. This is how we get to these sites. We've actually gone in and asked ourselves what happens in the gut surface. So to do that, we do something uh, called an endoscopy. And some of you may have experienced this, uh, where a video camera tube is placed down into the stomach, passes over the pylorus and goes into the duodenum. And we can both look at the surface here and we can also take a little tissue source, usually only about a couple of milligrams, very tiny, it's painless. And uh, we can then look closer at the tissue that we get from that little biopsy that we've collected here and understand more about how it responds in humans. Okay, so this is the science alert. I apologise. I have a couple of data slides, but I'll walk you through it. What we've done in this study here is we've asked the question, if we take this tissue out of the humans and put it in a, um, an artificial system to keep it happy, can we get artificial sweeteners that act on that lock to turn on the hormone release? And what we've shown is that we can. So this is increasing doses of two sweeteners, which we've, which we've added together. And as we increase the dose of this at the tissue, we can get this hormone being increased, its output being increased in the tissue. So this is the first evidence in humans that things that are sweet can trigger hormones, this particular hormone. Uh, so we're pretty excited about what this means. And again, it just underscores how important what happens in that gut lining is important in blood sugar control. So sugar, sweet taste receptors also play a role in sugar transport. I tried to, I, there were really boring pictures of sugar trucks. So I went with this old one from, <laughs> from 1962, which I'm sure none of us have seen because it's English. But um, nonetheless, this is my picture for sugar transport. Um, so you'll see it come up again in a sec. Um, Sugar transport is the important part where sugars move from the food we've eaten into our circulation. It's the first step, really, after we've ingested food that sugar has to pass through before it gets into our circulation. And so the delivery of sugar to our body is actually something that we haven't spent a lot of time in thinking about in terms of treating diabetes. And I really think it's quite a, a new way of looking at diabetes rather than treating it a bit like a bull in a china shop when blood sugar levels are already too high maybe we can control the gate, the door to the china shop a little bit better by understanding a little bit more about how sugar first gets into the body. So this is what our gut wall looks like. This is our surface where the food moves through. And there are two main proteins that play a role in bringing sugar in. This one up here is called the sodium glucose co-transporter. I'm not going to test you on this afterwards, it's okay. Uh, and this one down here is called uh, glucose transporter too. This one is effectively a vacuum. So its job is to use energy from the cell to pull all the sugar out of your food into the cell and then it flows down a, a, a concentration gradient into the circulation and is delivered to the body. So this is a particularly interesting one to us because it is a quite a powerful sugar vacuum, really. So there's been some studies done in animals uh, to look a little bit about uh, how this system works. The beauty about doing some work in animals is that you can change some of their genetics and then test how that affects their responses to sugars. And there was a series of animals, mice generated, that lacked these sweet taste receptors. So these guys couldn't taste sweet if you put it to them, they'd ignore it as if it was just another full food source, whereas animals that can taste sweet will drink it like crazy. So what they did in this study, they put these two groups of mice on a high sugar diet, high carbohydrate diet for two weeks, and then they assessed how sugar transport worked in their gut lining. What they found was there was a very, a threefold increase in the amount of sugar that was transported across the gut wall. So it was three times faster than what had been before. Um, and there was a big increase in the levels of those transporters that I mentioned. However, mice that didn't have the sweet taste receptor, there was no change, it stayed the same. So this is really strong evidence that the sweet taste and that receptor is linked to an accelerated rate of sugar entering the body. 
But to be, be certain of it, they had to do it with artificial sweeteners as well, because artificial sweeteners will only be recognised by that receptor. And they saw exactly the same thing occur, a threefold increase in the levels of these transporters. So it means that the sugars that we have and also the artificial sweeteners potentially can change the way the gut behaves in terms of delivering sugar to the rest of the body. So we've built up over the years a model of how this system works. And it looks a little bit like this, where you have a sweet taste cell in the gut wall that can recognise the sweetness of the food we eat, release hormones, and also change levels of glucose transport. So in effect, it's a sensor and an effector. And when you think about this from a physiological standpoint, it makes sense. If sugar is present in your food, you want to make sure that there's adequate sugar transporters available to bring that in. Um, so it's a tightly tuned physiology. Um, we're very good at making sure that the nutrient value of our faeces is very low. We're very good at conserving the energy that we eat in our foods. And this is one of the pathways that we make sure we don't miss out on nutrients. So when it's detected, the body responds to drag it into the circulation. So what we wanted to know a little bit more about, of course, was what happens in human disease. Is it the same? Uh, what drives this system? I think the important part of this is ahead of you, if you're reading at home. 50, diabetic, and ahead of you. Um, are sweet, these sweet taste receptors changed by glucose in the diet? Or what about sugar in the blood? And is it different in diabetics? So we did a study. We recruited folk like you. Uh, and uh, they came along to our, um, our research facility and we held their blood glucose levels at two different set points, one that was normal fasting levels and one was the, a level after a meal. And then, then we gave them sugars via that endoscope that I showed you. So it was only getting down into their, their gut wall. We were able to take samples from their gut wall and have a look at this sweet taste receptor a little bit closer. And what we found was that this sweet taste receptor behaves a little bit like a switch. So if you're a non-diabetic and you have normal blood glucose when you come in to see us, if we give you sugars, the levels of this increase, which kind of makes sense. This is probably talking to sugar transporters saying, I'm seeing a lot of sugar, let's increase sugar transport. However, on the second day when that, that same individual came in and their blood glucose was set higher after a meal, this went the other way. It turned back down, suggesting that there's an inbuilt safety in that, so that if, you're already, if your blood glucose is already high, this system shuts down. It goes in the opposite direction, potentially protecting your blood sugars from overshooting. But what we found was that in people that had diagnosed type 2 diabetes, the switch didn't operate in that same way. There was no way that this receptor was able to be shut down when blood glucose levels were high. And this may be one of the reasons why uh, blood sugar control is a little trickier in diabetics, and I think it's something that we haven't really appreciated when we talk to diabetic patients, and we think we need to know a lot more about why. And what happens in these individuals is their blood sugar levels, their absorption of blood sugar, uh, their absorption of sugars is higher as well. So not only is the switch set to on, but also the blood sugar levels, absorption of these sugars was higher. So... We're doing studies in this space to understand whether we can target this sweet taste receptor, not to stop glucose transport, not to reduce blood sugar levels from fasting, but to see if we can slow the entry of sugar to the body in people who have diabetes. Because these people already have uh, a, a slightly weakened ability to respond to rising blood sugar, if we can slow the entry of sugar after a meal or during a meal, it may better match to what they're able to manage. And it's a new way of thinking about type 2 diabetes. So we can have drugs that target this sweet taste receptor. These drugs could be very safe because they don't have to be absorbed. They can work at the gut wall. So these are drugs that would never, or have very few side effects, if any, because they would never actually enter your bloodstream uh, and could work for you at the gut surface with a high degree of safety. So we're looking forward to developing that and there's an opportunity to be involved in a study that we've got testing that right now. Um, so I'll tell you about that right at the end. Okay, probably what most of you came to hear a little bit about, though, was artificial sweeteners. Now, these are very pervasive in our food chain, I'm sure. A lot of you will remember or know some of these names here. Um, some of them have had very long histories. For example, saccharin 
was first described back in the late 1800s. Um, and some of you that are young at heart might remember this as well. This was the first ever mass-produced, mass-released, artificially sweetened beverage, TAB. Started off with cyclamate and then they switched it to saccharin after the FDA removed the cyclamate from their lists of food ingredients. Sometimes food manufacturers are a little bit sneaky though. They may not call it a name, they may call it an e-code. So sometimes on the back of your food, you may see ingredients added according to the e-code. These are sweeteners, and uh, particularly those in the 950 and early 960 series. Um, and they're not always immediately obvious. Often you'll find them in health-marketed foods, low-energy foods, um, that are still sweet, and that's the reason why. So if you do want to track sweeteners, be aware that sometimes they don't go by their name, they go by a code. So these are between 200 and 13,000 times sweeter than sugar, which is really incredible. And we're still developing new, the industry is still developing newer products in this space where they can use less and less of it to still retain the sweetness. And it's a big marketplace. Um, worldwide, this is expected to reach 2.2 billion very soon. And it's growing at about 5% a year. So this artificial food uh, part of the market is very large. And if we look at trends, uh, this data is a little bit old, it goes up to 2010, but you can see, while I've mentioned that a couple of these have had very long histories, the, the majority of these have only recently been in our food chain, when there's been quite an explosion of, of different choices. And you can see the number of food products that contain these is getting almost exponential here. So there's a large number of these, some that we know that are in the food, sometimes we don't. Um, and as I said, they're increasingly marketed towards those looking uh, to be health conscious. Okay, so when we talk about artificial sweeteners and health, there's a great deal of confusion in the marketplace. Uh, there's confusion between the food industry, uh, research, and so I'm just warning you that some of these areas are areas of active research and there are gaps. <coughs> And they're probably no more better illustrated than in marketing. So from one angle, the food industry, we get very strong signals that we probably should regret nothing. And there are studies that certainly support uh, the fact that artificial sweeteners can be beneficial for people looking to look after their weight. Um, and certainly they don't disrupt blood sugar levels at a single drink. On the other hand, you have people that are really quite concerned about what artificial sweeteners do in our body. And you hear stories... Uh, that they, uh, you know, one of the bigger concerns was that they were a cancer risk, that they cause fat storage, they trick your brain, they affect your gut bacteria, you can cause addiction. The reality is somewhere between the two is correct and we need more evidence-based research to take a position on where in that gap the truth lies. Um, and that's why we as researchers are trying to fill that lack of knowledge. Now, please don't take this down, because if you do, you get a medal, because there's too much information. Um, this is what's called a meta-analysis. So what this does, it looks backwards at all the studies that have looked at artificial sweeteners in humans and seen how those people have gone on to develop type 2 diabetes and seen whether there's an association. It's not causality, it's only an association. So I want to say that up front. This meta-analysis looked at the intake of artificial sweetened beverages, so those... It rejected, it wasn't people drinking more than 300 mils, it was the people that drank more than 300 mils in a given day. And it asked them uh, about, or it followed their type 2 diabetes risk. Some of these are really large trials, some of them have run over 30 years, so it's looking backwards on all those trials. This solid line here means no risk. Everything to the right means an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And you can see that for this study looking at sugars, there was a rightward shift in a lot of these studies, so that a high intake of sugar-sweetened drinks is associated with an increased risk of developing type diabetes. Most people are aware of this association. This is what's driving the conversation around a sugar tax in Australia and other countries that perhaps have been a little bit more prepared to take on a sugar tax. And I know the UK is about to start theirs very soon this year as well. Australia, we still seem to be lagging behind the debate. Um, and there is a lot of lobbying that goes on in that space as well from various parts of uh, politics and the food industry. But this type of relationship is driving that type of conversation. But when you actually look at the same the studies that also looked at artificial sweeteners, you see a very similar pattern. What you see is that the same sort of intake either 
unadjusted or adjusted for body weight, it shows a rightward shift in a large number of these studies as well, suggesting that what actually this points out is that switching from a high intake of a sugar sweetened drink to a high intake of an artificially sweetened drink doesn't reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Now, I don't want to scare anyone by that. What this is pointing to is people who are higher consumers than probably most, but it raises a lot of questions about how we, we understand that. There are other studies that uh, have supported that type of statement as well. Uh, regular high intake of artificially sweetened drinks has been associated with poorer blood sugar control, elevated HbA1c, um, and that graph shows that. And it can also even occur over a shorter time period during the course of five hours. It's been shown that artificial sweeteners given prior to an oral glucose tolerance test in some individuals can also increase blood sugar. But the reality is there's a limited number of studies that are good quality in this space. There's very few that have said, let's start the study now and look forward. They're called prospective studies. Most of them have been looking backwards and most of the information has been collected from things like food diaries where people are recalling what they had rather than actually being in a controlled situation. So and no studies have really assessed glucose absorption or had a focus on the gut. So this is what we did. We asked ourselves the question, do artificial sweeteners increase glucose absorption? And if so, does this worsen control of their blood sugar? So this is the study that we got people such as yourself involved, although this study was focused on people that weren't diabetic. What we did was we gave people capsules uh, that contained either a placebo, which was a cellulose, which isn't sweet, or artificial sweeteners. So these are two artificial sweeteners that are common in artificially sweetened drinks. Um, and they were both ourselves and the individuals involved in the study didn't know what they were receiving. It was double-blinded so that we didn't actually know the results of the study until we uncoded it right at the end, which means the subjectivity of the study was maintained, as was its scientific rigour. The dose that these tablets, they took three of these a day, generally before meals, over two weeks. Uh, this dose relates to each of these tablets, tablets being about 400 mils of diet drink, so about 1.2 litres a day. So most people won't put that away, but some people will. Um, this was a proof of concept study, so we wanted to use uh, an effective physiological dose. And I know some teenagers would have put that away before lunch, unfortunately. Um, so these patients, it was an endoscopic study, so the, the individuals came in twice, once before the study, and during that time we uh, did an endoscopic study where we infused glucose and we collected both their bloods and a little bit of tissue from them to, to look at the genetics of the tissue. And then they did the study and they came back and did that again. And so then we were able to compare before and after the supplementation. So, three data slides. I apologise in advance. I'll walk you through them. But I think they're important. This first one looked at glucose absorption. So this is the rise in blood sugar that occurs from the moment we are presented with a stimulus, a sweet stimulus in our gut, to the time it gets into the blood. So this is over a period of two hours here, and so a rise means sugar entering the body. So this is a sugar transporting from the gut into the blood. And what we found, there was a 20% increase in the, in the guys that had had the artificial sweetener supplementation here. So this means the sugars was able to enter at high levels and was able to enter faster into their blood circulation after the sweetener uh, supplementation over a short period of two weeks. So this means more rapid entry of the sugar to the body. This is the actual blood sugar levels during that time. Um, so the red again is the artificial sweetener group. This is the period that we infused the sugars in. And you can see there's this rise. But then in the individuals that had taken the artificial sweeteners, unbeknownst to them, um, there was a, a higher peak and a longer period that their blood sugar was elevated relative to those guys that had had the placebo capsules. This is 24% increase in blood sugar. So both of these increases are pretty clinically significant. For example, metformin, which probably a lot of you know about, will reduce glucose absorption by about the same amount we showed artificial sweeteners increased it. So these are not insignificant findings. So this shows a clear disruption of blood sugar levels in healthy individuals taking this dose. 
We also looked at one of these helper hormones that I mentioned before, glucagonolite peptide 1, and what we found was something going the opposite direction. The levels of this were lower in individuals. Uh, you can see that here there's a normal spike here in the group that had the placebo, but the group that didn't, that had the sweeteners, there was lower levels. And if we think about the gut and its structure, this makes complete sense because what has happened in these groups, in these individuals, is that blood sugar is more rapidly absorbed in the upper portions of the gut, so less of the sugar gets down to where this hormone is and can be deployed. So because of that, the levels of this hormone were lower and potentially the helping part that it does in blood sugar control could have been lower. So it's abnormal release of this hormone that helps blood sugar control. So we think these are pretty important findings to follow more of. We're really interested to see what happens in people that have type 2 diabetes. And we've got a study uh, that's just been supported by, uh, in part by Diabetes Australia to have a closer look at the, di the people with type 2 diabetes because we think potentially, because of what we talked about with the switch, we potentially think those folks are potentially a, a study population that we need to know a lot more about. Uh, and how they behave as well. They're also up to three times more likely, you guys as a population are up to three times more likely to drink uh, artificially sweetened drinks as part of sugar control, blood sugar control. Um, again, I want to underscore this was a proof of concept study, this was a, a big dose, and most people wouldn't drink this amount in a day, and I don't think moderation is a concern, I think it's for people that have very high intake patterns on a daily basis. We also looked at the gut bacteria that I mentioned before. Uh, very few studies have actually done this in humans. Um, we're increasingly aware that the, gut, the, the health of our gut bacteria, the number, the abundance, the diversity of this community is important in overall health. So we had a look at how sweeteners affected these guys as well. And we found that there were 12 specific bacteria that were significantly changed by artificial sweeteners in the patients that had the active treatment. And interestingly, the changes in the genes that these bacteria uh, are using was also shifted as well in a way that linked to what was happening in the host. So we think that these gut bacteria are probably changing their behaviour, it's having an impact on the host as well, and we need to know a lot more about that process as well. But our knowledge of gut bacteria is very, very early days. We know that they're likely to be important, we know some of the situations under which they change, but the future for therapies that may boost their activity, prebiotics, probiotics, in a really targeted way, is still going to take a little bit of time. But we're really excited about where that, that could go. Uh, and it's not relevant not just for type 2 diabetes, but a number of different diseases. Where are we in the research? Research is usually split over a series of different phases, right from the very first questions, identifying things that interact at that system, establishing whether it's active, who's going to, be, it's going to be tested in, test where it's safe, and then move it into clinical trials before a drug's available to the general population. Our sweetener trial that we're doing at the moment is at this phase here. We're about to take it uh, and study a compound that's already available in food. It actually reduces the sweetness of food for people. It's used quite a lot in America to reduce the sweetness of natural sugars in jams and the like. So it's, it's a food-grade ingredient that can uh, slow down, uh, reduce sweet taste. And what we want to do is test that in people that have type 2 diabetes to see whether we can help them out with their blood sugar control. So that's at about this phase here. We're doing studies now and there's an opportunity for you guys to be involved. Uh, whereas our studies with gut bacteria and what we can do in the future with those is a, at a much earlier phase. So, but we're just as equally excited about where that could be. So two new potential pathways to new anti-diabetic medications, which we hope research can keep bringing to the people that need it the most. So... If you've been asleep up to now, you can wake up. <laughs> this is the take-home message part. The gut can detect sweet. And in turn, that sweet detection can control glucose and sugar entry to the body. This appears to differ in people that have type 2 diabetes. And because of that, it may form the basis of new medications for those people. And as I mentioned, we have a clinical study underway. Whoops. And the last part of the study shows that regular high-level intake of sweeteners increases glucose entry to the body and may pose a challenge to maintaining blood glucose in the normal range. And I think while we're still doing a lot in this space, and we need to test it in much more diverse populations than just non-diabetics, 
I think at this stage, moderation of behaviours, if someone is, is putting away large amounts of artificially sweetened drinks on a daily basis, is likely to prove to have long-term benefits. But we will have to wait till the outcome of larger clinical trials to know the specific advice to public health uh, and new alerts to people. OK, now I get to advertise. I've got you guys as a captive audience, so why not? So we do research that relies on the good grace of all the people in Adelaide and around to be involved in this type of research. In fact, a lot of what I've shown you came from people just like you signing up for our research. Uh, and these are, our group is recognised as one of the world leaders in this type of research. Uh, and we present our findings internationally quite often. So it's a way Adelaide can really punch well above its weight and be involved on something that changes things on a world stage. We need your help to find better treatments for the 415 million people that I mentioned right at the start that are living with diabetes. And you guys can be involved by contacting us through the contact details at the bottom, uh, by emailing us, there's information in your flyers, and also Nicole and I will be out at the table after this talk to, to, to answer any other questions that you don't want to ask in forum or to sign you up. So we'd be really excited to have you guys involved. And the last part of the talk is really just to thank the people that have backed this research for a number of years. Uh, the federal government through the National Health and Medical Research Council, Diabetes Australia, and also the Royal Adelaide Hospital Research Fund. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.